Welcome to Home Education Matters, the weekly podcast supporting you on your home education journey. Hello and welcome to Home Education Matters. And today I'm joined again by Helen Royston, who I had a wonderful episode with, one of our very first episodes, I think episode two, actually. And it was all about starting out in home education and early days as a home educator. So lovely to have you back with us again, Helen. But just to for anyone who maybe didn't meet you in the first podcast that I did with you, perhaps tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, hi, well, um, I've got three children who were all home educated a grand total of home educating for 30 years from start to finish um <laughs> let me see what else can i say none of them are currently home educated because my youngest um finished his gcse's as a home educated child and then has chosen to go to college to do his a levels so you're um, out the other side i am quite recently but i am still involved um in locally in home ed world (laughs) you're you're one of these home educators that have such a wealth of experience that we cling on to you in the home ed communities and say you can't go anywhere we still need you (laughs) well it's nice to feel wanted (laughs) (laughs) so today helen and i are going to be talking about all the different approaches that there are to home education so all the different ideologies, all the different uh, ways that you can do it. And I have to say, although we have, I think something like 25 or 26 of these, that is, I'm sure there are like 50, 60 more that we have not put on that we just don't know about because there seem to be as many different approaches to home education as there are home educators, which is lovely. And that is one of the beauties of home education, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think uh, in, at the end of the day, all these different titles for a style of home education, its it doesn't really matter which one you pick or even if you pick any of them. Um, it's all about tailoring things to what suits your family best, really. Yeah, and it's also, there's a lot of crossover, isn't there, between some of these, and you can call it what you want. What was that Taylor Swift song? Call it what you want. Doesn't matter what you call it. (laughs) We're going to start with the, what I call the kind of standard out-of-the-box ones, and then we get slightly, I want to say wackier, but maybe not wack, maybe just less well-known as we go through them. We're going to start with homeschooling and the difference between homeschooling and home education. So Helen, go for it, because I know there is a difference. What is the difference between homeschooling and home education? Okay, well, I think the waters have got muddied quite a lot, um, what with COVID, to be honest. So uh, homeschooling back in the day is generally associated with America, because that's what Americans call home education. And then, of course, we got the whole COVID malarkey and everybody doing school at home, provided by a school. Uh, So that tends to be, you know, how people think of homeschooling in this country is that you are doing school at home and it can cause some confusion with new home educators because they still think that schools are going to provide materials for them and they're not. Once you deregister, you don't. That doesn't happen, obviously. So home education is the umbrella term for all the different styles of home education in this country. Um, although many people do obviously say homeschooling when they mean home education just because it's what's used uh, in America. And if you look up homeschooling, you're going to find loads of mainly American resources. Wasn't there also a thing where homeschooling was originally or officially when you're off school and you're sent work home from school? So like during COVID, but also didn't it happen before COVID as well when maybe you were still on the school role, but homeschooling was when they provided you with work at home? Was that right? Uh, There is some of that, but that's also called EOTAS, education other than at school. Ah, so uh, some EOTAS children, some chil- some people that come under the EOTAS uh, umbrella will be on a school register and some of them won't be on a school register. But that's okay. uh, but there's still the responsibility of the local authority and, and not 
electively home educated. I've got you. So so when you're talking about home education in this country, it's home education. And if you're using homeschooling, that generally means the same thing, but it's more of a global term uh, from America. So it's not actually a difference necessarily in how you do it at home. So then we get on to the, different, the differences about how you can do it at home. And the first main approach you can take to home education in this country is if you are structured, if you have a structured approach. So a structured approach, as far as I see it, is when you... You don't exactly replicate school at home, but you are you perhaps have a sense of times of day when you do lessons. You maybe have an environment that you tend to use, maybe a desk or um, maybe you have, uh, you know, sp- specific lessons that you like to do, maths, English, sciences, that kind of thing. Is that how you tend to see structured home education, Helen? Um, yes, it's much more like recreating a school atmosphere at home really so it might be uh you might have a t- quite a rigid timetable uh there might be curriculum involved that you follow quite strictly as part of that timetable it's it's let it's quite inflexible that's how i see it so see so it might be that um some people use online schools and things so they're restricted to the timetable set by the online school and that would be very structured. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely advantages and disadvantages, aren't there, to structured, curriculum-based online schooling. Now, these are the top, the first three approaches that I've written down, actually. So we've got structured, we've got curriculum-based, where you actually maybe map yourself to the school curricula, which would be things like the Key Stage 2 curriculum, what they're doing in Year 9, that kind of thing. You're pulling a face, Helen, is that wrong? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. That's just one curriculum, though, isn't it? That's, that's just, right. That, that's the national curriculum. To be curriculum-based, it doesn't have to be the national curriculum. It could be any curriculum. There's loads of different curricula out there. I've got you. And and then so you, you've got structured, then you've got curriculum-focused, whatever curriculum that is, mm-hmm. and then you've got people that may choose to do an online school. And these are all approaches that perhaps would fit into the the structured approach, which is the idea that – um, you have particular times when you would do lessons and perhaps a sense of, of school at home. And there's advantages to this, right? In as much as perhaps if you work from home and you need to have some time, you know, every day where you do your work, then it's quite nice the children can do their work and you're all sitting at the table together and, and you have that sense of a timetable and a routine. And it's also nice, perhaps, if you've taken your child out of school for reasons that aren't academic reasons or, you know, perhaps because they've been bullied or something like that. And then but you still want very much to stick to a very structured approach. Maybe your child prefers it that way or maybe you. That's just how you prefer it. And so there's advantages, aren't there? But there are definite disadvantages, aren't there, Helen, to a structured approach? There is, actually. I think there are. I mean, obviously, as you say, it's whatever suits your family. Um, But I think the inflexibility of the structured approach will limit can limit you in terms of say home ed groups that you can go to uh, meeting other home educated families because you haven't uh, unless you add that into your structure of course but maybe you know some like spontaneous spontaneous activities and things like that and also it one of the disadvantages for me would be that sticking to the structure and being too rigid about it could become a cause of conflict, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's true. It might alienate your child or it may be one of those where you have that push and pull about whether they want to do lessons, whether they want to engage. And also as well, it takes away a certain amount of self-motivation for learning so it takes away that sense that the child may naturally pursue learning if given the space for it but as I say there are a lot of advantages to it as well if you're busy if you've got multiple children if you want to put your child back into the school system eventually that kind Mm -hmm. of thing so then we've got the semi-structured approach which is probably the sort of like the middle ground between structured and non-structured so semi-structured might perhaps look like you don't really don't want it to look like school but You also quite like them to sit down and do a certain amount of lessons, you know, a few times a week or something like that. Yeah, I think so. It's uh, semi-structured. It might just be that you have a structured morning and then the rest of the day is free, you know, uh, for them to follow their own projects or play. Um, 
it can also be a little less inflexible, you know, so you can sort of say, right, today, kids, this this museum trip's come up and we're going to go and do that. Um, we'll go back to this textbook tomorrow. Um, and again, but again, that depends on your family and your children. You know, as you said, some children really like to know what they're doing next and they like to have some kind of structure in place. So, you know, a semi-structured approach can be a nice way of balancing it, you know, whether it's the parent or the child that wants some structure, it, it gives a bit more leeway. Yeah, and, and I think one of the advantages is that you can be more responsive. And so maybe there's times of the year, like summer, when you want to do fewer lessons and then winter, you think, oh, you know, we'll maybe be a bit more structured at this, uh, you know, this time of year. But I suppose one disadvantage might be that perhaps it's neither one thing nor the other. So, you know, your child may be thinking, oh, you know, well, it's not structured enough for me. And then you're, but another child might be, well, it's not responsive enough for me. And so maybe it's a bit sort of, maybe the middle ground is not always the best ground. I don't know. I think it's something that worked really well in our house. Mm. In actual <laughs> so, fact, I've always, yeah. I've always described myself as semi-structured as well. So yeah. I'm trying, I'm trying to be as, as impartial as possible. I think what oh, the yes, disadvantages are, but I, th I think probably to a degree, I suppose you're neither one thing nor another. And that, that is good in itself. I mean, the Buddhists built an entire religion on, me, <laughs> on the middle way, didn't they? Oh, so what about, what about the other extreme in this country, you've got unschooling, and radical unschooling and autonomous parenting. And unschooling is when you allow your child to uh, lead the way when it comes to their learning. Whereas perhaps radical unschooling and autonomous parenting is is when you allow your child to lead the way pretty much in everything. So it's, it's not just limited to learning. Is that how you tend to see it, Helen? Uh, yeah, definitely unschooling and radical unschooling. Uh... And autonomous education, I would say, because I would always say that's the path that we followed with my eldest was autonomous home education. Um, so it was definitely about following his interests um, and the, letting him, giving him the space to learn things for himself as well. If you take unschooling then as the, the sort of the general term for when you perhaps allow your child to decide how, when, where, what, why they learn. And you respond to that. So you become more of a facilitator than a than a teacher. If you were to look at that as an approach, which is a very popular approach in the UK, isn't it, unschooling? In actual fact, in my experience, it's the most popular approach to home education uh, in the UK. Although perhaps that's shifted in the last couple of years with, because we've had a lot of people join after COVID. Um, but certainly when I, when my children were younger, unschooling was the, the sort of standard approach to home education. And let's think about some of the advantages of that. I mean, it's very responsive and you and you know the the things that I always love about home education, the freedom and the flexibility, it very much honors those kind of values, doesn't it? It really does. It really does. In fact, to be honest, I um I would put on autonomous and unschooling in the same kind of bracket, really. Uh I would never say that we were radical unschoolers because I do kind of I'm I'm not one for letting kids make entirely their own decisions um, about things like bedtime and mealtimes and food and stuff like that, obviously to a certain extent, um, and with flexibility, you know, but uh, in general, I, I, I always like to have a little bit of time to myself on an evening. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so, um, yeah, so unschooling and autonomous education, that was kind of where I thought we would continue with my two youngest because we'd really enjoyed that responsiveness and that flexibility. But it's quite, I found it a struggle with two. So it worked really well when I'd only got one child. Mm. But then when I'd got two close together in age, I found that really difficult personally. I know the people can manage it and manage it beautifully. Um, but for me, the disadvantage was that I didn't feel like I could balance the two children equally. Hmm, that's an interesting, interesting you you say that because I think possibly one disadvantage you might you might perceive of unschooling is that it it, it does involve an awful lot of compromise between yourself and the children, a lot of dialogue as well, because everything gets discussed and everybody's views are equally valid. So 
it you have to have a lot of patience and and that's difficult when you have multiple children perhaps yeah it's difficult if you've not if you've got a limited amount of patience and anyway <laughs> regardless of how many children you have so yeah that was it as well it's um it just became so long-winded to even leave the house you know and like I said and that's fine for some people but I can't cope with not being being in it all day. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I need to go outside. <laughs> yeah, I think I think some people they they do lean more towards a slightly more structured approach where they sort of say, Do you know what I want to be doing these things now? And I know you don't really want to, but we are mm. going to be doing them as a family. And having done a podcast on autonomous parenting and a great podcast mm. on unschooling, I can I can see that from their perspective, they would say, even with multiple children. They would say, we, you know, the children learn dialogue, they learn discussion, they learn compromise, oh, that you know, different priorities and, and flexibility with each other. And so I think perhaps one of the advantages of unschooling is that it's as much a journey for the parent, isn't it, as, as it is for the child? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's a lot to unpack there as a parent when you're going with all that. And like I say, so it works absolutely... It, can be really wonderful for some people but it's but people should always feel free to be able to choose different something different just because it's the most popular or maybe most common way of home educating no one should ever be made to feel like they're somehow doing it wrong because they're not unschooling yeah I definitely had that myself a number of occasions when I've been to home ed play dates when the children were younger and I think some with the, every all the mothers would be talking and then they would sort of look at me and say I assume you're you're an unschooler because everybody was an unschoolers and and I would say no actually we're quite structured and and there would be that terrible <laughs> elongated pause <laughs> when nobody said anything anymore <laughs> and I was left to sit in sit in judgment <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, you just, you end up owning, you end up owning mm. your approach. And if it works for you, you and your family, you tend to think, well, this is, this is how we're doing it. And it works for us. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and I think, I think one of the problems with unschooling, it's not a problem with unschooling itself. It's that often people perceive it, that nothing is happening because they're yeah. unschooling and that yeah. they can just leave the kids, you know, the kids are just left to their own devices all day. That's not the case, really. I, th I think, in actual fact, one thing I noticed when I did the the unschooling podcast is how many misconceptions there are about unschooling. Mm. Um, and this idea that it's the sort of lazy or easy approach, and it's, it's mm -hmm. the complete opposite, actually, Absolutely. because it is. And actually, this may come in as one of the disadvantages of that approach is that it's very hard work and it's very time consuming for the parent. You don't get a lot of... I mean, one of the reasons I didn't pursue it as an approach was just because I'm quite lazy and I like my own time on my own. And so I quite liked having times of the day when I knew I would get to have a cup of tea and read my book because the children were doing their lessons. So it's a hard approach, I think. It's, it's, it takes a lot of work, but the rewards are also massive. The, the relationship that you get with your children at the end of it can be, can be really positive, I think. I was just going to say that your relationship with your children is not, you know, can be positive, whatever style of home education you've used. You're it's absolutely not, right. It's, and uh, It's not exclusive to unschooling. No. And as long as you're all happy with the approach, then I think that's the most important thing. So our absolutely. next approach is flexi schooling. So flexi schooling, I don't think we've got probably a lot to say on this. This is basically when you split your time between school and home. So you maybe do two or three days at a school or maybe mornings at a school. But this is very, this is very much dependent upon your local school agreeing. And it's normally something that is actually quite difficult, I think, to arrange. And it's become, seems to be becoming fewer and further between since COVID as well, I've noticed. Well, I don't know whether it's becoming fewer and further between, because, mainly because, you know, it is hard to arrange and organise. Um, and it's you haven't got, a, whereas you have a right to home, to home educate, you don't have a right to flexi school. It's entirely down to the head of the school. Sometimes people get flexi schooling if their child is in school full time and they're having problems there. So the school might agree to some flexi schooling on that basis. And sometimes they'll agree to flexi schooling on a basis of a child that's been home educated and is going to start school. So, but the aim is to get the child full time into school. 
So yeah, the trans- different- the transitions, aren't they? Quite that's often right, transitions. transitions, yes. Yeah, that's it. And the, the if you were interested in flexi schooling as an approach, there is a whole Facebook group dedicated to flexi schooling, but also your local groups will know any if there are any schools around you that are open to flexi schooling as an, as an idea. And normally I would say that it's normally when your children are younger that that's an option. Yes, I've not. I don't think I, apart from people whose children have got some kind of medical needs, I've not come across anybody who's managed to arrange it at a secondary level. Okay, world schooling is next. Now, world schooling is close to my heart because I did world schooling for years. And this is, well, it's a bit like unschooling and nobody really agrees what it means. But <laughs> but world schooling, as far as I'm concerned, means basically where you use the world around you as your school. Normally, that means that you travel to different countries and cultures. It doesn't have to mean that. It can mean that you basically sit in your home and learn about learn about the world through the internet or whatever, but normally world schoolers are, you know, backpacks and, uh, you know, getting on the plane and and living and immersing yourself in different communities and different cultures. That's generally what world schooling is about. I'm, I'm surprised it's uh, the internet bit. I've never... I've, I've never heard of that as a, a form yeah, of world you can be, Yeah, you can be yeah. a world schooler that never leaves your home. I know I they were quite I didn't believe it either, but it's true. <laughs> there you go then. So you learn something new every day. <laughs> and after world schooling, we've got road schooling, which actually was suggested by somebody on our Facebook group. And it basically kind of means as an approach, it means uh well I called it van life, but it's it's like you know, where you maybe you're not actually flying out to exciting, exotic countries, but you're learning from the country that you're in yourself. Maybe you're traveling around, maybe you you live permanently in a camper van or something like that. And then your approach to learning is very much on the road and seeing what you see as you go around the country. Yeah, I think that would be quite a nice thing to do, wouldn't it, really? Learning around, mm-hmm. learning about your country as you go and traveling around. I like the idea of that one. That's another one that perhaps works yeah. better when the children are younger. And I think perhaps one of the disadvantages of that might be that it's a little difficult to arrange exams and things like that as your children get older, perhaps. I think the hardest thing, with, I think definitely when your children are younger, I think the difficulty with that is um, that older children often start to need to be with children their own age and they want to make friendships outside the family. And moving around like that makes that quite tricky. Yeah, and I think the same could be said for world schooling. Most world schoolers, their children are sort of like 11 or 12 or under, and you don't tend to get the secondary age children world schoolers. You do. You do get teens who are world schooled, but they're, they're, there's not so many of them. And like you say, I think I think definitely world schooling and road schooling are approaches that perhaps suit families better with younger children just because, like you say, teens like to hang out with other teens in a more permanent way, don't they? They do. These are quite often they need things. They need something beyond the family, don't they? Because they just want to, not all, obviously, but, you know, in general, I would say they want to start spreading their little wings a little bit and finding the feet out in the world. They do. They do indeed. Much to our displeasure normally as parents, because we've got <laughs> by then we've just got so used to having them around. It's like, no, you can't go. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean you want to go out without me? <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a difficult adjustment for parents to make, isn't it? But it seems a very seamless one for teenagers to make. Oh, yeah. So the next approach is car schooling. Now, car schooling, you might think is a bit like a bit like road schooling, but I think it's actually slightly more the idea that a lot of your learning can take place when you're in the car. Now, this is very nice for busy families, isn't it? You know, who may, and like you said yourself about prioritizing going to social events and things like that, well, you could fit your education in when you're in the car. And this might look something like uh, having conversations as you're in the car or audio books or educational games, and you get your learning done when you're in the car. It's an interesting approach. Helen, have you come across this one before? Oh, yes, definitely. And I would say that uh, when my children, probably up until the, you know, for the first few years with my youngest ones, uh, I didn't have a car with my eldest. So we were on a bus quite a lot. Uh, so I suppose bus schooling was going on there. Bus schooling. <laughs> <laughs> but we uh, we definitely, with my two young ones, I had a car. We would be in the car. We went to an awful lot of groups and we had to travel around up to an hour each way sometimes. and. So car schooling was something that we've definitely experienced. And it, of course, yes, it does involve um, chatting to each other and a lot of discussions, but it also, in, and audio books and things like that. 
Uh, we also would have language learning tapes on, math songs tapes on. Yeah. We'd play games that involved, like car games, travel games, you know, that involved looking at what's going on outside. They had things in the back seat with them, you know, like they had little, I don't know what they're called, those little things that had like a little organiser that hangs mm -hmm. behind the driver's seat. Oh, yes, we had those, and I used to put lesson things in there to keep mm -hmm. them busy on long journeys. Mm -hmm. That's it, yeah. So they'd have pens and little games and little toys and things like that in there. We'd sing a lot of songs together. We'd learn the alphabet while we were in the car. Yeah, we did loads of things. And that's when Letterland came in really useful because they would ask how to spell words and things like that. And because they were little and still learning the shapes of letters... They couldn't necessarily say an ah, you know, it's an ah, and draw what an ah looked like because they're in the back seat mm. and I'm in the driver's seat, but then I'd be able to say Annie Apple, and they knew exactly what I meant. <laughs> what was it called? Letterland. Letterland, yeah. yeah. I've not come across that one. I oh, mean, really? this, yeah, one thing I think that car schooling leads on to is an approach that actually isn't on our list, but is conversational learning. And that normally is in cars when you have these long chats about weird things that they suddenly come out with. And then, you know, nowadays, of course, when they've got phones, they can sort of Google stuff as well and say, oh, actually, you can answer questions in that way. So I think conversational learning as well is something that home educators do a lot without perhaps realizing that that's also a method of home education. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the things um, for new home educators to get their heads around, really, is, you know, when we talked about de-schooling before, I think in the previous podcast, that style of conversational learning and recognising that that is a valid form of learning, you know, is uh, is really important. Yeah. And actually talking about de-schooling, it's not on our list because it's not really an approach to home education because de-schooling is, is a transitional period, isn't it? Where you and your child sort of shake off the assumptions of school and, and shift yourself sort of like out of that mindset into the, the freedom and flexibility of the home education mindset. So we, so that's what de-schooling is. So that's not on our list because it's not a, a long-term approach. But coming up, we've got some very interesting approaches because these are, these are approaches that uh, perhaps people have heard the names of but aren't really sure of. So we are going to talk about in the next 10 minutes or so, I will give you a little, a little um, snippet of what to look forward to. We have got Charlotte Mason, Montessori, Reggio Emilia, Rudolf Steiner, Waldorf kind of approach and the classical approach. Now, these are, I, I, I sort of see these as the kind of named approaches to home education. So where if you were to Google it, you would find lots and lots of resources and lots and lots of different approaches. So should we take them in turn? Should we start with Charlotte Mason? We interrupt this broadcast to remind you to like and subscribe to our podcast. And don't forget to join our Home Education Matters Facebook group, where you can find details on all our podcasts, any links or resources mentioned, chat to our guests, request upcoming podcasts, and even come on the podcast yourself. Do join us over there. Helen, tell me what you know about Charlotte Mason. Not herself personally, I'm sure she was a lovely person. <laughs> tell well, us about she... the home education approach. <laughs> well, she was a Victorian, so I never met her. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I'm sure she was lovely. <laughs> I think I might have got on quite well with her, actually. So yes. it's um, it's all about living books. Charlotte Mason was something that I found myself, when I came across it, it was just like, oh, my goodness, this is what we do. This is so much of what I believe in. Uh, it's all about reading great books to your kids that help to bring subjects to life, um, getting out there and doing some nature studies, spending loads of time playing out. Um, very short, short lessons was a new idea to me, but it really worked well. Narration, you know, when you read something and then they, your children narrate back to you what it is. There a lot of art and music appreciation, handicrafts like making things, hobbies and knitting and sewing, skills that are going to carry them forward in life. What's a living book then? Is, so, that, is that, does that basically, I always, I always think that just means like a good book. <laughs> But does well, it mean something more? It, a good book is kind of subjective, you know. I read books that I think are good books, but they're certainly not living books. Uh -huh. <laughs> so know? would a living book be something like um, George Eliot, for example? Uh, yeah, I'm thinking more of, you think younger. You okay, know? so would it would it be something like... I mean, yeah, George Eliot Enid probably Enid Blyton? Be, 
Would that count? No. Well, the Enid Blind for the nature studies and things like that, because she's mm. got some quite good natural world books, you know. Uh, are they old books then, basically, are we talking? They're not all old books, no, but most okay. of them are classics. So it's things mm. that have got a rich vocabulary. It's not dumbed down. Like Black yeah. Beauty or something like that, for example. Yeah, Would like that, that count as a living book? Yeah. Now, who things... decides if it's a living book or not? I don't know. Do you think you decide or do you think it's decided for you? No, it's interesting because, like you say, yeah. your idea of a good book and mine might be different. And I wonder whether – I suppose it, it, maybe that's just something you choose within your family. But I think the idea of a living book is that it's – like you say, it's like a, a classic and it's got a rich vocabulary and maybe worthy in some way. I don't know. I don't know. I think a lot of it is it's about something that brings a subject to life. Mm-hmm. So some books can be good books, but they can be really dry. You know, sometimes, yeah. I mean, I've read books to my kids and by the time I get to the last page, I'm sobbing practically. This is so sad. You know, Michael Morpurgo, we're Michael talking Morpurgo, about you. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and so he always gets me. Um, but other ones as well, you know, and it's, the, but it's to do with that richness of vocabulary as well. Something that is meaningful. You know, there are loads of really kind of good picture books. They're fun picture books. They they might be lots of little rhymey bits. There might be really cool pictures in there that are all bright. But then, and you, the books that you'd want on your bookshelf for your kids, but they're not necessarily living books. Living books. Know? So a Julia Donaldson may not be a living book. No. No, that's a shame. I like Julia Donaldson. I like Julia okay. Donaldson, and we have a lot of her books, and I will read them to my children. I also know we've read things like. At Beatrix Potter is more of a living mm. book because the mm-hmm. artwork is so good as well. Charlotte Mason's main thing is kind of that children are born persons, so they're a person in their own right. Not that they're mini adults, you know, they're not, but they are there as real people. So it's, for me, the living books fits in with that philosophy in that you're not talking down to a kid, mm. you know, you're not treating them as if they're stupid. They're not. Because it's not simplified vocabulary or not anything simplified like that. vocabulary, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's the next... more sweet than that, though. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, would, if, 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 I would just say if anybody's interested in finding out about living books, that to really ha- Google it and have a look at it because that is just my interpretation and I'm not saying that that is the ultimate word. Okay. <laughs> All right, so it's not the ultimate word from Helen. What about, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's not. What about the next one, which is the Montessori approach? So my idea of the Montessori approach is that it is um, when you set up lots of stuff ready for the child. So you you maybe it's a room with lots and lots of things, like some crafty stuff, some games, some hands-on activities, and you just allow the child to like potter around. Is That's my perception of Montessori. I think, again, there's a little bit more to it than that. Um, Probably. You say, yeah. You're saying I can't sum it up in one simplistic sentence, <laughs> and that's very upsetting. <laughs> Tell us what bad. more it's there not, is to it. It's, it's not bad. It's not bad. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the activities are all kind of quite meaningful, they're supposed to be, you know, and I only know a tiny bit about Montessori, okay? And I do, I, there's certain aspects of it I really, really love, like you say, everything's set up ready. And we had all these trays and mats so things would be on the tray or we'd have a they'd take it and put it on their mat so that's their workspace and nobody interferes with that workspace and that was really really useful especially when you've got more than one child you know you've they're not and everybody respects that space so they can work on Mm -hmm. their own thing the only i mean my son did my youngest he did go to montessori nursery for about a year two mornings a week and he loved it you know I loved, it was so calm and peaceful everything's at a child height so it is about it's not just about the activities they've got it's about helping them learn independence as well you know so coat hooks are at a child height so they can get their own coats we had little sweeping brushes and things so that they'd got child-sized tools that actually worked to do real jobs. Mm-hmm. Does not mean that kind of thing. Those were the bits I liked. Yeah. So that so because I was just thinking as you were saying that that perhaps yet again it's a, an approach that doesn't fit so well as the children get older. But actually, there are elements of that that you could definitely take on as the children get older. 
So our next approach in in amongst the named approaches is Mm. Reggio Emilia. And I have to say, uh, this one was suggested by Anne Gallagher in one of our Facebook groups. And this is a new one to me. I've not come across this. So this is an Italian constructivist approach. You can tell I've Googled it, right? It's Italian constructivist approach, but it seems to be very much project based. It does. I it is a name I have come across. Um, and I have to confess, I thought I always linked it to Montessori. I didn't know what it was. So I because it's not really that much spoken about in home ed mm. places where I am. So I also Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and yes, it seems to be very much the project based learning. And it's to do, and it's very it's all about child being child led and following the children's in, interests, whereas the and parents collaborate with them. So rather than you're not just there, you know, it's not just letting them go off on their own little jaunt. You're helping them, but it's letting them guide you as well. So it's not just even like, um, what do you want to learn about this week, kids? let's learn about hamsters. Okay, here are a lot of projects and crafts about hamsters. It's not like that. It's Mm. more they go to your your child follows where how they want to learn about hamsters and you facilitate that and work with them and support them and help them. So it's a bit of teamwork in a way. That sounds like it fits under the umbrella of unschooling, perhaps, or at least it's it's on the spectrum between maybe unschooling and structured. It's more on the unschooling end of the spectrum, perhaps. It is. It's definitely one of the child-led ones. Yeah. You know, there's quite a lot of child-led home education methods, I think. So uh, the, one of the things that I got about it as well when I was looking into it the ideas that you know if to encourage good la- use of good language because kids want to communicate and parents model good sort of model the whole project based learning by undertaking their own projects yeah and actually that's an idea that is also in the charlotte mason approach isn't it that the parents are a source of influence in how they approach learning in the world and that that trickles down to the children yeah yeah, um, I think so, definitely. You know, there's all this kind of modelling. I think that's in a mm-hmm. few things, isn't it? Yeah. So you, there's the, with the parent, it's uh, the Reggio one is uh, saying that you think out loud while you're working on your own project. So it's not even just that your kids see you working on your own hobbies yeah. and projects, that, but the, as you're doing, you're, you're thinking out loud so that your children then have a method to emulate. Yeah, actually, that's interesting because I read about that a few years ago when it comes to using using mobile phones, which was that parents should say what they're doing on their phone to their children so that because the children have no idea what you're doing on your phone. And quite often, I don't know about you and other home educating mums, but I'm almost always doing something for them. So I'm organizing something or I'm researching something. Mm. And, and, and I heard a few years ago that you should say, oh, I'm just arranging this or I'm just doing this. And I've started doing that. I started doing that with my children a few years ago. And it definitely helps because I think they then see what you're filling your day with and, and, that then, like you say, turns into a kind of modelling where they then think, okay, this is, I'm going to focus on these things and I'm going to focus on those things. That's a really good idea, actually. I like that idea with the mobile phone because you're right. Um, I think kids just think that you're scrolling, you know, because, or just watching YouTube. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're doing that, you're actually letting them know that this is a tool and you're using it as a tool. And also if you are, you like you say, you're using it to organise things for them. They can see then that you are not ignoring them, you know. It, it is for them that you're doing it, so you're still thinking exactly. about them. And that's got to help connections. Them. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And then the last of our named approaches, so we've had Charlotte Mason, which on the spectrum perhaps pushes a bit more towards structured in as much as, you know, that perhaps – narration dictation that kind of thing and then we've had montessori reggio emilia and the last one is rudolf steiner which i also have i have it down in my notes as rudolf steiner slash waldorf they do they link right rudolf steiner and waldorf Uh, i think waldorf is the method and rudolf steiner is the Ah. one who invented it 
Okay, um, that's good then. So they are I, similar I kind of thing. But they are the same thing. Okay, great. So this is a, this is a, I've, now I've got an insane thing written down in my notes here. I've got German anthroposophical belief. And what on earth is that? Anthroposophical. You'll have to tell us, Helen. Any idea? Um, what I know about Steiner is um, that anth oh, anthroposophical. Uh, basically, I don't know really what that means, Me but I have come across it previously. But basically, he believed in a holistic approach to education so that you're not just educating the brain, you are educating the body, the soul and the spirit. Yeah, I think I think there are definitely elements of this which are a little bit magical and a bit fantastical, aren't there? That I think some, sometimes you know, it's, is there something about colours? I think there's something about colours, maybe different colours or something like that. And I, and I so because I know that some of the some of the schools because there are Steiner schools, aren't there? Yes, there are. Uh, yeah. yeah, so some some of the schools have sort of some slightly kind of weird beliefs going on, uh, but also there is from perhaps a a more positive perspective there are is a lovely focus on the natural world and on practical mm -hmm. and kind of creative skills aren't there within the the Waldorf approach oh absolutely I think there's some really nice things about it you know and having equipment and toys that are made of natural materials I liked the I like the idea of some of the handicrafts that they do you know um and the idea of seeing a project through from start to finish of the process so like knitting you make your own knitting needles, you spin your own wool, you dye the wool, you knit the wool, yeah, you've got a finished garment. You know, I, I really like that kind of idea. Mm -hmm. And they've they have some festivals that they follow, like I can't remember what they are, but they do have some like seasonal festivals as well, like a wheel of the year kind of thing. Um mm -hmm. but I'm not sure what they're connected to. I did read Up on Steiner when I first started home educating, but it's a very, very long time ago now. Yeah, and it is quite complex as well isn't it some of these systems they are quite rigid in some ways within their curriculum in as much as you know you're meant to be doing these things in this way so it's one mm. of the disadvantages perhaps of you know these four approaches that we just listed is that they are reasonably rigid as curricula so you sort of like yeah. this is the curriculum this isn't the curriculum no you're disagreeing um I'm not sure, but I think you might be right when, when it comes to Waldorf. I've got mm -hmm. no idea when it comes to Reggio Emilia. Mm. Um, Montessori, um, I didn't I didn't see that as being rigid at all, really. You know, there was different materials available to kids and it was about using those resources. But then but again... In, in, you could say that in if, by, by allowing certain things in and not allowing other things in that you're being restrictive. In as much as perhaps, for example, if Montessori's don't maybe have like a bank of computers, then you could then in some ways they're restricting what children are, have access to by just not having that there sort of available for them. I'm being Com controversial. Yeah, I've got no <laughs> idea whether Montessori says you're not allowed computers. Uh, you know, I've never it's seen a computer in a Montessori school. But I've only seen the Montessori anyway. nursery. Um, and I My children really went to a, briefly went to a Montessori school um, that went all the way up to sixth form in Oxfordshire. And I, I didn't see, I only saw computers at the very oldest age. And I wonder whether they are, because there is a there is an approach to home education, isn't there, which says that screen use comes later, you know, when, when the brain is more developed and they have like a an idea of this age is for this and this age is for that. <laughs> I think that for Steiner, there's definite things like mm. that with rigidity, mm. rigidity, definitely about when mm. you can, when what age they start to read and things like that. Um, I mean, the thing with Montessori and Charlotte Mason, they were, you've got to remember that when they were writing there and Reggio Emilia as well, computers weren't a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, for Charlotte Mason and Montessori, they didn't exist. Yeah. You know, so. That's, you know, you can't say that they would be excluded from that because they didn't exist. Would you say that the Charlotte Mason approach is rigid in as much as some some books are, are given more value than others? No. Okay, fair I enough. I wouldn't, actually. <laughs> no, because, I, I mean, it depends on your approach. You know, that's down to you as a parent in the end, at the end of the day. Mm. You know, I think there is a, a discouragement to give twaddle, but twaddle, um, twaddle. <laughs> but there is, 
But at the end of the day, you know, that's what what you provide in your home. Same as for anybody, you know. If you've mm-hmm. got only the classics in your home, then that's what they're going to go to. They might go to those first or they might just go, oh, I'm not reading that and do no reading at all. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's it's entirely up to you. There is, it doesn't have to be rigid at all. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so that moves us on to the last of of the sort of big approaches, I would say, which is the classical approach. And this is very age-based, isn't it? So this is the idea. I tend to think of this as the kind of Roman, the Roman idea, because <laughs> I'm sure it must be based on, on ancient Rome. And it's the idea that you have three stages of uh, children have three stages. They have age six to 10, which is a kind of absorbing information kind of thing. And then you have 10 to 12, ages 10 to 12, which is more like some abstract ideas come in, maths, a bit more maths comes in. Then you have the rhetoric stage, age 13 to 18, which is more systematic and rigorous kind of approach to learning and a lot of rhetoric, which is learning the ability to express yourself sort of in in discussions and get your point across and listen to other people's points. So it's this idea, I think, that when they're younger, they absorb information and then they go through a slightly more abstract period where they're learning abstract ideas and then they go more to how they're then interacting with the world. That seems to be the classical approach as, as far as I can tell. What do you think, Helen? Yeah, again, it's not something I know very much about because it um, – I think this did, when I did read upon this, it did seem too structured for us. So I didn't really go into it that deeply. Um, yeah. So, yeah. It's not a very popular one, I don't think. Although I think it, what is popular is the idea that certain ages, there are certain stages of childhood where things are perhaps easier or harder to learn. And I know there's quite a lot of home educators who perhaps think that some of the abstract ideas in maths are best learned when children are slightly older and and things like handwriting maybe because the you know the the sort of muscles and the bones in the hand aren't formed and i think i think a lot of home educators have that kind of idea of just that some ages sort of work better for some things than others i'm not sure if it's even down to ages particularly but more as um when the time is right with the child because all children are different and have different abilities and are ready for things at different but they are ready at different ages. You know, I, I think most home educators are not that rigid. I think classical is more popular in America. I was rather liked the idea of the rhetoric stage because I just think, I think rhetoric is such a thing, it's, it's such a lovely thing that we just don't tend to teach. Although I think you get it in perhaps more in America in like debate classes and things like that. But I think, I think the rhetoric stage has always been quite a nice idea, but you're right. I think the classical approach is something that we you don't tend to see in the UK. Maybe it will make a comeback. Maybe people will listen to this and be like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on with the trivium or whatever it's called. <laughs> <laughs> so okay so these are they are the sort of big named approaches so now we get on to the these maybe ones that people haven't heard of so much but the the first one is quite well known and we have touched on it a little bit when it comes to the Reggio Emilia approach which is project based learning or sometimes known as unit studies so yeah carry on helen go i would say that unit studies and project based learning are different actually no would you yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't. That's yeah. fascinating. Tell me why. Yeah, uh, unit studies. We did a lot of unit studies. Unit studies. They are cross curricular. They can be parent directed. Um, they can be. They can encompass all sorts of things. But project based learning is child led, and it's it's definitely much more. You can plan a unit study. You can't plan project based learning. Now that's In fascinating because. I know for a fact that a lot of schools are embracing project-based learning and they're definitely not child-led. Yeah, well, they're not doing project-based learning. They're just calling it projects. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's that's interesting because in that case, what I, what I thought was project-based learning, I've been taking from schools because I know quite a lot of teachers. And so I assumed that project-based learning was basically this cross-curricular approach where the child says, do you know what? I really love dinosaurs. And you go, ha ha, I can turn that into a project. And then you make a massive cross-curricular project about dinosaurs and you tell your child, here we are, these are your lessons for the next eight weeks. Would that count as project-based learning or would that count as unit studies? If the child had said they're interested in dinosaurs, for an example. That's unit studies. 
as units. So the That's project based learning, the only difference is that you don't choose something your child's interested in. Why would anyone do that? That doesn't make any no, sense. No, no, project based learning, they choose things the children are interested in. Oh, the sorry. Children, the oh. child, the child leads the project. Okay, so <laughs> an example of project based learning in our house. Okay, mm -hmm. my kid is, my youngest is massively into board games, right? And he's got a game called Unmatched that he really likes. And it's a case of you've got different characters that you move around a board and your characters have got cards that decide what that, how you, what, what they do kind of thing and how you play against each other. And, and this is something he pretty much did himself, really, because he's a bit older. Um, he needed less um, collaboration with me. I did help. I was collaborative in as much as I test played with him, all the things, um, all the characters he'd made and the packs of cards he'd made. But for him, he chose his characters that he wanted, created a whole set of new characters for this game. He did all the research on the characters to make sure that the card names, the illustrations and the actions on the cards fitted with the character that he decided on. So he used uh, either he used a lot of characters out of books or historical characters, historical figures. So he read the books. I provided the books. We discussed the characters in the book. So there's a collaboration going on there. Um, he then, I mean, he, he found a, his own website he, uh, where you can set everything into these cards and the text, and then it just prints it out for you. So he did all that. Then he's sleeved them all, and we've test played them, fine-tuned them. We've had a lot of discussion on there. So there's some collaboration going on there. So that's one example of project-based learning. Um, so that's project-based learning as it would work for a teen. But I'm thinking mm -hmm. for a five-year-old, for example, okay. who says, yeah. for a, for a five-year-old who says they want to be a paleontologist, then if you were to if you were to design a project that was cross-curricular in its approach that went on for about eight weeks and was fascinating and all about dinosaurs, would that be unit studies or would that be project-based that, learning? That, that would, would be unit, unit studies. studies. So how, in, that, okay, in that case, how could you make that project-based learning instead of a unit study? What would shift there? Well, you could still do, you could do lots of strewing. So, you know, you've got um, things around the house that the kid that are pro that are dinosaur based that might they might want to pick up, they might not want to pick up. If they say no, you go with it. You don't try and convince them to have a go. So you're strewing, say, that's that's an unschooling term, isn't it? For when you put lots and lots of things out and then the child just does or doesn't engage with them as they, as I they think want. I think strewing comes into a lot of them, to be honest. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, it's strewing comes into, it's definitely something, you know, you can, it's about, it's like offering something to your child, make, helping them to become aware of something beyond their own knowledge. Who invented the word strewing for this? Because I can't say it properly. And for me, scattering sounds so much nicer. Strewing, it's a weird one, isn't it? It sounds a bit like stewing. But is no, it? I've, it's, well, no, you have things strewn about strewn, in your house. Do yeah. you never have things strewn about in your house? But this is exactly it. I have things strewn, but I don't have, I don't, like, the verb for me doesn't work in the strewing. I don't know. I just can't say it properly. Uh, for me, scattering, I don't know. I wonder who invented that strewing things. Well, it feels it, weird. Well, it's been around as, as I, I know we have things strewn about in our house. We've always Do you? Like, it's a proper Strewing word. Out. Strewing Is out. It? Strewing's a proper word. I. I'm going to start throwing it into conversation more. Yeah. Strewing things around. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> it's definitely been. I've been using it since I started home educating. Definitely, it's been around that long. You know. So project, but project based learning under those circumstances would be much more. Your child is interested in dinosaurs. You put lots of dinosaur stuff around, and then they can or cannot engage with it as they wish. Unit studies is when you design a project, and then you say, "This is what we're doing." Yeah, it's kind of like that. But all yes, unit studies is when you design the project. But you can also make them in collaboration with your kids as well. You know. Uh -huh. um, but for project based learning, it is following your child's interests. So it's more about responding to where they're going with the project. So, you know, they might want to learn about dinosaurs, but 
they might actually really want to learn about just a T-Rex. So they might start talking about T-Rex. So you would maybe go, you know, it might involve going to the library. It might involve watching documentaries. It might involve, it might say, right, I like this T-Rex. I wonder if I can make one out of Play-Doh. So you provide the materials. You know, this it's that kind of thing. It, it is yeah. listening to them and letting them lead the project. Whereas a unit study, not always is parent led, but can be parent led. So if we're As thinking again about that and, spectrum, yeah, unschooling on one end and structured schooling on the other, then you've got project based mm. learning is towards the unschooling side, and unit studies is perhaps more towards the structured schooling side. Yeah, it can be more towards can the be. structured schooling side. Yeah. And talking about approaches that are perhaps more towards the structured schooling side, we've got loop schooling. Now, this was a new one on me. I actually had never heard of this, but loop, the loop approach, is it an American thing? I feel like it is where you basically have, I'm going to attempt to to describe it and I'll probably get it wrong, but is it when you say have, okay, we've got like seven things we want to cover. We want to do English, math, science, blah, blah, blah. And then you just, you just loop through them day after day after day or, and if you don't get to it, don't worry, you just pick it up the next day. And so you don't have that rigidity of a timetable, but you have a, a structure of the subjects that you want to do. That's a very bad description, but is that about right? I think so. Yeah. I mean, my, that's kind of my understanding of loop um a loop system um so it's kind of you're still working with a curriculum um really and just sort yeah, it's, of starting yeah. up next day from where you've left off previously so there's no planning as such because it's it's already there for you you're just continuing from where you've left off i think i think it's probably one of these approaches that a lot of people instinctively do and didn't realize it had a name I think that's quite, well, to be quite honest with a lot of these things, you know, when you start out, when you start thinking about what you're doing with your children, there are elements of all of them that we're probably all doing. So, I mean, for me, the more, the main, um, it would be eclectic. Yeah. Little bits from all the different approaches, right? Yeah. And it's not even taking them for, you can take it from approaches, from different curriculum or from, you know, your own ideas really Mm -hmm. as well. And I think it's interesting you say that because the next one, which is delight-directed approach to learning, delight-directed, I repeat that because I suspect lots of people listening won't have heard of that. This is actually very similar to unschooling, isn't it? Where, you know, it's this idea that you follow your child's interests and passions and that this has come come out uh, in a lot of these approaches, hasn't it? So I think, like you say, it's the kind of thing that perhaps you instinctively do as a home educator and didn't realise it had a name. But delight directed yeah I, th- I think it's a lovely name it's yeah. lovely isn't it it's, it's absolutely lovely delight compared directed. to some of the others like yeah. you know unit studies and like some you know some of the named ones radical unschooling i always think and actually unschooling itself i think is i've never liked the term unschooling i think people don't really understand what it is but delight directed is beautiful isn't it it's nice it is very much so and that is definitely about you know following your child's interests um and being child-led and the strewing involved there as well so that you're not more strewing a lot more strewing yes <laughs> The next approach is, um, I'd not heard of it. And as soon as I read it, you know, when you read something and you think, that's me, that's what I am. I am this, I am this thing. And you're like, claim it. You're like, yes, it's a thing. And I didn't realize it had a label and it's called Tidal, Tidal. Oh yes. Yes. Beautiful idea. And if I, I try to sum it up, it's the idea that you get a kind of rhythm to your days that then ebbs and flows and it can flow from one day to another or it can flow from times of the year to the other so sometimes and some days you're structured some some parts of the year you're more unstructured some days you're less structured and you just kind of flow you go with the flow it's very it resonates very much with me i'm a very chilled kind of go with the flow person so tidal yeah tight the tidal approach to learning yeah the I, for me it came across as that yeah, the ebb and flow, you know, that some days, sometimes in your life, you've got more energy towards being focused learning. And then you need to sort of take a breath, you know, to sort of like relax and kind of absorb the learning and let the learning become one with you. 
Oh, I love it. You see, we're <laughs> becoming so zen just talking about are we, it. Are we? Yeah. And then it's just, <laughs> and it, I, what I like about it is it, you know, sometimes people will start saying about, oh, my child's been working really, really well. They've done all this stuff and now they're just really, they don't want to do it anymore. They're really, really resistant. And it kind of allows that resistance. To, it yeah. allows you to work with that resistance and sort of go, yeah, it's fine. Just and yours as a parent as well, because yeah. there are times. I know there have been times when we've been really on it when it comes to doing kind of lessons, and then and then we'll go into another kind of season of our mm. home education journey where I feel like we're barely doing anything and we're all just chilling and and enjoying each other's company, and that's okay, isn't it? And I think that's one I, one thing I like about tidal learning is it gives yeah. you that kind of it kind of gives you that uh, authorization to do that, I suppose. Yeah. And it's that, again, that's kind of. It's not necessarily a a method as such, because you could use that approach with all the other things we've been speaking about. Yeah. Um, it's just kind of like, it's just, yeah, it's just, um, I don't really know what word to use to describe it. <laughs> I know. It is. It's just one of those beautiful kind of chill yeah. things. I like it. I, I've not come yeah, across yeah. it and I, I think it's, uh, I think it's rather lovely. So our yes. next approach is a, is a really popular one, really popular and increasingly popular, I think, in the UK. And it's wild schooling. I then, thought it was very forest schooly, actually, to be honest. Yeah, I think so. I think wild schooling, forest schooling, are, are you could perhaps consider an approach in as much as it's very focused on nature and it's very focused on letting children be children and allowing them to immerse themselves in the natural world and um, there's a certain amount of positive risk taking if that makes sense you know where okay. you allow children to explore maybe using knives or if that sounds like outrageous but what no, I, mean, no, you know, I know what you mean yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sort of use you using that kind of bushcraft skills i suppose yeah. and i think that yeah. is for a certain age group that is very popular in the uk now in the home ed community isn't it there's loads of forest schools about, yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. You're not I think saying a lot... much about it. Do you not like it? Um, I don't know. I don't know anything about it really. It wasn't something that my kids were ever interested in. They weren't about when mine were younger. And to be honest, it was something we just did. We actually, with my eldest, that was kind of we just did those things anyway. But yeah. now the forest schools, and then my kids did scouts. Uh, Cubs and Scouts, the younger ones. Um, one of them loved it, so they did all that kind of thing at Scouts. The second one hated it, so they were never interested in going to forest schooling. And I think forest schools have become popular because they're very much a drop-off thing. Yeah, now it's interesting you say that because I think there is an element of that. So maybe if we actually extricate that and think more about the wild schooling approach, which might be much more, you don't necessarily go to forest school, but as a as a family or as a, you know, as a home ed community, mm -hmm. you perhaps have play dates in the woods and you, yeah. and you have, and I think there's, there's sort of a sense of using play and nature stories curiosity those kind of things that yeah. you then incorporate into the learning yeah again that's something that to me is just part of home education and i would not have put it as a a separate method um because it was just always part and parcel of what we did anyway with friends or as a group as part of our local group um but yeah i guess for some people, though, it's that thing, isn't it? If it's if it's there, it's part and parcel, you don't think about it. But if you're not living in, yeah. uh, if it's not something that you would do or you don't have friends that naturally lean towards that, then maybe it is a method that you would seek out and try to practice yeah. more deliberately. Yeah, because you might think, well, I'd never thought of doing that or I'd never mm. thought of that approach. And actually, that leads us on to the next approach, which I want to kind of say in contrast, but perhaps that's being unfair. But uh, Lois Penner actually suggested this, and this is game schooling or the kind of gamification of learning. So this is, um, game schooling is definitely a, um, an increasingly popular approach in home ed. And perhaps it's yet another example, as you say, of where you'd maybe take elements of this, but perhaps not have it as your whole curriculum, although I'm sure some people do as well, where where you, you use games in order to enhance your learning in order to ac make learning more accessible to the children I suppose well definitely I I would say that we were game schoolers as well like I say game we schoolers. were very very eclectic we play mm -hmm. board games so much in our house um, we've got so many board games and as part because we did unit studies 
really. We did a lot of unit studies. Um, we did lit-based ones and we did topic ones. There was always a game involved somewhere, you know, so we would do, so yeah, definitely game schooling. In fact, uh, one day I came down and said, my kids like to have, my two youngest ones, they were definitely like, we want not exactly a timetable, but we want to know what we're doing next, you know? So we had this little rhythm to our days. And every now and again, they would kind of like go, right, that's it. We're doing something different today. So, because it was still flexible, you know, we weren't very rigid with the structure. I came downstairs and there was a pile of board games. And they said, this is what we want to do today. Nice, and work through them all. Work through them all. And they'd selected board games particularly. So they'd got one board game that involved maths. That's maths for today. Um, we're going to play Dixit. That's English. We've got Travel the World or something. Um, that's Geography. Nice. Uh, so we've got something else that was a history game. So they, they've got all these games out and they decided they were about me eldest. She was a probably my middle one. She was about 10-ish at this point, you know. So she had got into this concept of subjects and she just, they listed them all out and that was our day. I love the fact that they preempted any kind of uh, retort on your part that maybe it wasn't learning or they're like, no, but look at all these subjects we're going to be covering. I love the fact that they prepared themselves oh, for that. Oh, they absolutely did. They were very much, even though we were, I always say we were kind of, we were fairly semi-structured and, uh, you know, there was definitely a, a huge dollop of child-led learning going on in our house. You know, and it was definitely following them most of the time. But they, yeah, so it was like, we're definitely game schoolers. We've got a lot of board games. I would deliberately look out for games that would be part of a topic that we could use as part of a unit study. Uh, and they would be used in different unit studies, you know. So you've got, there's a lot of crossover and things like that. And so that's always been part of our lives using games because you can learn so many skills, you know. Not just math skills, it, but you can, you know, really basic math skills from starting from starting out, rolling a dice, counting the dots, counting the spaces, rolling the dice, what number are you going to land upon, you know, using like number lines. Use two dice and you add them both together. There's all sorts of little math practices going on with different games. I guess as well, game schooling can include things like Minecraft curriculum and things like that as well, right? Those kind of online games. Yeah, I suppose it can really. I'm not. Tech, I'm not. It's tech tech games. Yeah, I mean, personally, I do get that kids learn from playing video games, but it's not something I am very up on, really. And mm. I do know they do learn. I know they do learn from that, especially Minecraft and stuff. I mean, I think yeah. one of the bonuses of that approach is that you're the child is more engaged, and the child is. It's a different accessible route into learning for the child but perhaps one of the downsides might be I don't know that it's maybe not very linear as an approach or maybe not you know that you perhaps don't sort of you're not working through subjects in that specific way so I suppose again it might be something that you could incorporate into you might want to incorporate into your into your home education journey. Yeah, you can incorporate it easily enough um, and it, again it's something that would fit into many different styles of home ed. Rather than it being a complete method by itself, I think that's the thing. You know, a lot of these, there's all these different ideas, but they're not all complete methods in this by themselves. Yeah, and that brings us back to the idea that you mentioned about eclectic. You know, having mm -hmm. that eclectic approach. Mm -hmm. So, in in our Facebook group, Rachel Allen came up with a, a term that I'd not heard of before, which was slow parenting. Have you heard of this one before? Yes, I have. Ah, I spent far too much about time on parenting. social media. You're very good. You know all of these approaches. It's very well. impressive. You should go on Mastermind. Be you know, <laughs> your your starter for ten is homeschooling approaches. Okay, so tell us about slow parenting. I don't really know much about it. It just seems to be much more relaxed, much more about being home centered, child, but um, and not worrying about getting your kid to every single group going. And I'm guessing as well, maybe not not sort of comparing with other children of the same age or not matching up to a curriculum at school, not sort of thinking, oh, okay, they're 11, they should be doing X, Y, Z. It's much more maybe taking your own time and. I think as far as home education goes, none of it should be comparing children to the same age or the school curriculum. Absolutely. Absolutely not. 
because it's oh, I do feel quite strongly about this <laughs> so do I actually no so do I it's actually probably one of the things I feel most strongly about because I think it just saps all the joy out of home education doesn't oh, it absolutely and it's all about giving your child that personalized education you know and there is no behind there is no in front because it's them and they should measure their achievements by what they themselves achieve and not by looking at what them next door are doing. It's like that famous cartoon, isn't it? In the famous in the home ed world anyway, of when I think you have like a bunch of animals and they're all going to be assessed on how quickly they can climb a tree. And there's like a yeah. dolphin and there's, you know, and there's all sorts of different things. And it, and it just, it's ridiculous to sort of set that kind of arbitrary decision about what is success and what isn't when, when all children are different. Absolutely. Absolutely. So our last approach to learning, I'm kind of coupling these in with each other a little bit, but these are, I think Natasha Jane suggested this, which was a cooperative learning space and also maybe co-op based home education. So co-ops obviously are very big in America, and this is where all the parents would get together and they would kind of, you know, parents, I mean, we all have such amazing skills. So we would then basically you bring all the children together, all the parents together, and then the parent would would do lessons on their own field of interest, I suppose, their own expertise. So one parent might do uh, stone masonry, another parent might do yoga, another parent might do maths. And, and so I think that's the co-op based approach. And then cooperative learning spaces, they're slightly different, aren't they? I think, I think cooperative learning spaces are this idea that uh, perhaps they go to what feels like a school, but is actually very autonomous. So the pupils make a lot of decisions about day-to-day activities and how how the school is run. How, how do you feel about those two? Yeah, co-ops is a big thing in America. It's not really something that happens over here. We have much more kind of, we do have community groups where home educating parents get together, might I'm, I'm, I'm rent a hall bring some skills together and do some skill sharing with that's been going on for a long long time i think co-op based schooling is more formal than that yeah um it's not something i really know and i think you've got to be you'd have to be a bit a little bit careful in this country when it comes to the legalities of it all and illegal crossover into illegal schools to be fair yeah. to be honest and you do have to be careful with that and and actually i think that is one thing when it was mentioned in the facebook group i think i did say isn't that a school mm. um because i think in order i think in order to be legal you you know after a certain a certain number of children and a certain number of activities, kind of the way it's structured, you end up having to register as a school. So I think a lot of these places that are cooperative learning spaces, whilst they may be run very nicely where the children get a lot of say in how things are done and they can get as involved or or not, depending on how they feel when it comes to any learning, they are basically in effect schools, aren't they? That's what I said. That's very much from what you've said. That's what it sounds like to me. Uh, that's not really it's not really home education to me if it's a school but yep. i don't know again it depends doesn't it whether it's a, if it's something you do once a week then mm. yeah but if it's something where they're going in every day then you know it's uh st- yeah, that's it's, when you start getting yeah. onto the you've got to be careful with the legalities yeah, and then it's drifting more towards flexi schooling, part time schooling, that kind of thing. Yeah, well. and yeah. that takes us back to the beginning. So we've done a whistle stop tour here through some of the most standard ones, like um, structured, semi structured, unschooling, world schooling, and then we've done some of the very big named approaches: Charlotte Mason Montessori, Reggio Emilia, Rudolf Steiner, and the classical approach. And then we've done some kind of fun ones that maybe aren't whole approaches in themselves: loop. Um, Tidal, my favourite, uh, Delight Directed, which I think is probably your favourite. So, <laughs> some, of, some of these really nice ones. And so if anyone is listening, do join our Facebook group and tell us which approach you think you have. Maybe you have a mixture of different approaches and maybe that you've got an approach that we haven't mentioned. I'm, I'm In actual fact, I bet loads of you have an approach we haven't mentioned. And if there's any obvious ones that you think we've missed, come and tell us on the Facebook group because that would be very nice to know because we uh, we canvassed lots of opinions before we did this and I'm sure we've missed out lots. I'm sure there's many we haven't put down. <laughs> well, there's probably as many um, ways to home educate as there is home educators, really. It's, uh... Yeah. It's just that we could all give it a different label. (laughs) That's exactly, I think you're exactly right. And I think also at this point, I would probably say that 
really, you know, to go back to Taylor Swift, it, you know, call it what you want. And it really doesn't matter what label you put on it. And um, as long as it's working for you and your family. So hopefully right. these, this has been inspiring in some way. And if there's any approaches that you've heard, you can now go and Google them and think, what was that one again? What was that like weird one about, you know, sort of like Italian constructivism? Oh, oh and if anyone knows what anthroposophical means, do please tell us in our Facebook group, because I'd love to know what that means. I'm guessing it's something weird and wonderful. So yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing what that means. Well, thank you, Helen. It's been lovely chatting. And I feel like we've, I feel like I've learned a lot, actually. I feel like I learned a lot about these approaches. And it's uh, it's, yeah. all, it's very interesting. So thank you so much, Helen. Lovely to have you with us again. And do come on the podcast again. I will. Thank you. If you'll have me, it's been really interesting. I've learned a lot as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Home Education Matters podcast. See you at the next one. Have a lovely day. Bye.